Cooper PD. No town, no streets. Just a dry stretch of desert. Cooper PD, white man in a hole, was what the Aborigines called the early prospectors. And they took the name for the region. This lunar landscape is the opal capital of the world. 80% of the world's opals are found here in South Australia on the fields of today's Cooper PD. But the first gems were discovered quite by chance. In 1915, J.R. Hutchinson and three companions were looking for gold. They traveled with six camels across the drought-stricken outback. They didn't find any gold, but Hutchinson's 14-year-old son, William, stumbled on something else. Opals. Opals radiate an iridescent light, a rainbow of colors inside a stone. They are not just valuable, but exquisite. And in the loveliest, a fire glows deep within. Somehow, the colors of the opal transform the dry and dusty Cooper PD into a home for those who don't mind a life of hard labor, of earth and heat and dust. The men who meet on the opal fields of Cooper PD are as rough as the stone for which their hearts beat. Men like Will Black, Bob Wright, Rick Wilson, Jack Cannell, and old Willie Guff. They are a team welded together by one thing, opal fever. And this barren landscape is their world. Here they own a joint mine, the Dead Horse Valley, 1,000 square yards of prospecting rights in the middle of opal country. The license costs only $150 a year, but what they're buying is a dream. Oh, I think we're all here as gamblers. We're miners, but we're gamblers, you know? I mean, life's a gamble anyway. Well, we all live on that dream, don't we, that maybe tomorrow's a big day, you know? <laughs> Everybody's got that dream, eh? <laughs> but every stain, every stain you find is different. And I like the colours and the patterns and all that, you know? That's what really keeps me here. Dawn on the fields of Cooper PD. A new day, a new chance for the hunters of the stone. Like so many others, this day begins with the roar of the diesel, with dust and dirt. For Rick and his friends, hard work and tough conditions are all part of the game. But it's a dangerous game. For here on the minefields of Cooper PD, the risks are all around. Every step must be carefully considered. Underfoot are explosives and 100 foot mine shafts. In the darkness, many a shaft entrance has become a tomb. And every time the miners descend into the depths on a wobbly, rusty ladder, they never know if they'll be coming back. Down under the earth, the men burrow like moles. These tunnels were blasted out by dynamite. They could collapse at any time, but danger comes with the territory. Down here, everything is impromptu, jerry-rigged. They make it up as they go along. The miners are constantly drilling new holes for explosives, pushing their tunnel deeper and deeper into the ground.
Up above, Bob makes the dynamite charges by hand. It's a makeshift little package, but potent. Hold our engines, tuck them in. Hold in there, like that. They snip off about, about an inch. The white powder, that's the explosive. And then, we pack it. This handmade little bundle will blast right through solid rock. In Dead Horse Valley, blasting takes place every day. None of the miners are explosive experts. They just learn as they go. But they've been lucky up to now, unlike some of the others in the region. We had a couple accidents last week out on um, the 14 mile and that, you know, and bloke's stupidity within themselves, you know. You've got to leave pillows. People will see opal, and all of a sudden you get this vertical or a trace, and they realise they've got this pillow. You must leave pillows, and um, if you don't, that ground, you dig underneath it, and just bring the whole roof down. There's no warning, it's just one big thud, quick. And I mean, you just hear wham, thud. After the explosions come other dangers, poisonous fumes. If you've got an old blower, you put a set of shots in, you've probably got, you've probably got to wait a while for the fumes to clear. But with a blower, you can, bla you can blast, and then you have your flower going, sucks all the fumes out, and you can work straight away, more or less. The blower is a giant vacuum cleaner. It sucks up huge lumps of rock as if they were breadcrumbs. The powerful suction pulls the debris up through the pipes, all the way up to the surface. Above ground, Will and Rick take care of the diesel pump and generator which power the blower. These are the two most important pieces of equipment, and they are constantly on the verge of breaking down. And nothing is more difficult than getting hold of spare parts in the Australian outback. The desert is littered with the shells of automobiles, stripped of anything that might be used for the opal hunt. It's a graveyard of cars, remnants rusting away under the scorching sun. Out in this hard land, dynamite is not just a tool to hunt opals. It's also used to solve differences of opinion. This is the remains of an old blower. They had an argument, the company had an argument, and one of the partners blew it up. Set a couple of bags of nitro pull underneath it and just exploded it. This is all bits and pieces of it lying around here. Rough methods for a rough place. Problems are also caused by the clandestine nighttime visitors to the mines, the night shifters. Do a lot of damage because when we're mining, we mine safely. But when they come in, they just because they're trying to do it quick, they put a heap of shots in. Blow down under the level and then knock it down, you know, and they make a mess of the mine. They leave the roof dangerous. And... So out here, who protects the mines and miners? Government officials? The police? We are the police. We police our own territory. <laughs> you have to protect your property, yeah, you know, and this is your property, yeah. Oh, you know? So, well, if it comes to it, you'd have to shoot it, wouldn't you? Especially, uh, some of them are pretty mean, some of these night shifters, you know, they, they'll try shooting you too. You know, so, you have to be prepared. Come on, boy. The 
men don't work all the time in Dead Horse Valley. Today is one of those days when they try their luck someplace else. They are on their way to the old deserted shafts. Their equipment, as always, the ladder. Will scans the desert floor. The largest opal in the world was found in an abandoned shaft. And it wasn't even covered with dirt. So it's always worth looking. In this wild west, the stakes and the dangers are as high as ever. But the rewards are great. If Bob seems nervous this afternoon, on edge, there's a reason. He has just found a cache of opals, but not in the dead horse mine. Back at his camp, he agrees to show us his find. Look at that, brother. Look. Three thousand bucks an ounce. Three thousand. Ah, oh, that's only a sample. Look at that. Huh? Top quality. Yeah, look at the quality in that. That's what all the opal buyers want to buy. Eight mile. Eight mile open. Bob owns a small private mine behind his dugout. He works it with the help of Jack and Old Willie. This is where he discovered the opals. And he still hasn't gone through the entire find. The process will take most of the afternoon. Bob puts the loose rock into the centrifuge, which separates opals from sandstone. The machine will turn for two hours, removing the sandstone, while Bob waits and hopes. And finally, it's time to clean the stones once again and see if there are a few more opals to be retrieved from the pan. This is a lucky day for Bob. Opals. This is what all the dangers are for, the result of all the hard work. Opals are just spherical particles of the mineral silica, but the more perfectly aligned these particles, the more brilliant the color. Like all opal hunters, Bob always says it's not the value of the stones that fascinates him, but their beauty. Of course, once he's got opals, he has only one thing on his mind. I got business, business, brother. Business. Sorry. I like picking out all Same here. But when you turn round, I got 40%, and you want to cut me 15% off to cover th th two or three hundred dollars, or oh, hundred dollars of bloody expenses. It's a fucking different story, Bob. 20% off hey, my fuck you. Get what fucking are you, what stuff, are you doing? Bob. I don't I fucking know. Oh, you, know you, you can stuff your fucking heart, open up your fucking ass. No, no, no. I don't no. want to know, Bob. What do you get? I don't care what I fucking get, you greedy bastard. No, I'm not when money is involved, you're even you're friends you're can you're become you're rivals. For Bob and John, the search is always more fun than the business. 
But sooner or later, when things cool down, they can sit down together, have a few beers, and put it all behind them. Uh, Willie's going to explain. I'm wrong, not you. No, no, so no, wait a minute, John. Oh, um, John? Yeah, which two? Hey. And so, in the end, oh, harmony is restored in Dead Horse Valley. Hey. Hey. That. And Bob's rough opals, they're on their way to Yanni Athanasiades. Yanni is one of the best-known opal dealers and cutters in Cooper PD. Over the years, he's handled a lot of gems and seen a lot of opal hunters come and go. In, uh, in opal mining, perhaps um, it could happen to anybody at any time. Uh, today, you are broke, uh, you don't have uh, money even to buy cigarettes, tomorrow you may have a lot of hundreds of thousands of dollars in your pocket. Uh, it, you only need to find the right place to dig this beautiful stone out, and it's very easy then. The best opals will be found tomorrow. That's the motto of everyone out here. And I did get the opal fever. Um, well, uh, since, uh, since that day uh, that I got involved in opals, uh, that's, my, that's my life. Uh, opal, it's my life, uh, the last 25 years. Uh, I don't know to do anything else. A life in Kubrupidi, a life for the stone. Kubrupidi is a very nice place to live. Um, you make very good friends. Uh, people are very, very friendly. Um, a newcomer in Kubiti will feel at home uh, after a few days. Uh, everybody, everybody is welcoming people uh, in Kubiti, and it is a different place. More than 60 nationalities live in Kubiti, and many of them live underground. Even the Christian Orthodox Church on the hill is carved out of the rock in a so-called dugout. There are some very beautiful houses. From outside especially, you don't see a dugout uh, very much. Uh, you really have to go inside. From outside, it looks like uh, a hill with one door. You go inside, there are some beautiful homes. One day, everybody comes back. We have people that coming back to Kupiti after years and years just to try once more. Like the old timers, even though they long ago buried their dream of a great find, still they return to Cooper Pedy to spend the evening of their lives here. Or like the professionals who want to try their hand one more time in Cooper Pedy to see whether technical sophistication is luckier than dynamite and a pick. Sidney Absalom is working with a high-tech machine which carves its way through the earth precisely and efficiently. He works his way down, 20 yards a day, every day. The tons of loosened stones fall directly onto a conveyor belt and are transported upwards to an elevator. But for all the machinery, Sidney knows it's his own senses that are key to the opal hunt. The telltale sound of crunching glass, the taste, the feel of the stone, any of these might indicate the presence of opal traces. No color in. No color. That's an opal line there. Yeah. Only bony pot, matrix bony pot. But 99 out of 100 holes don't contain opal, just dirt. At the shaft entrance above ground, a new heap is growing. And wherever there's a heap, 
there are men like Kevin Wilson, men they call the noodlers. Kevin works with the dirt others have cast off. He feeds it into a hopper where it is funneled inside. In a darkened cabin under ultraviolet light, Kevin's wife removes the opals, which show up white. Everyone in Cooper PD is looking for treasure. Everyone has a dream. And Cooper PD has enough space for all of them. Of course, some people will discover opals, some won't. But everyone who comes here finds something else, a wide open way of life. Here, you can live any strange way you want. And they've got the interior decorating to prove it. The people of Kuber PD seek freedom, and the desert gives it to them. The attraction of this hard, empty land is precisely its emptiness. Out here, there are no bosses, no social obligations, just an endless horizon. Even in death, the residents of Kuber PD thumb their noses at convention. This tombstone reads, have a drink on me. Because, well, no, it's freedom. It's freedom, you know, not like the city where you have to be up at 9 o'clock in the morning and home at 5 o'clock at night, you know. Here, if you want a couple of days off, you just take a couple of days off. How many days? Oh, you can take as many as you like. You know? This rough freedom, wild, and a little crazy on the godforsaken opal fields. <laughs> and once a week, on Saturdays, the opal hunters leave the holes and the tunnels behind and come out to the track to exchange the thrill of the colored stone for the thrill of high-speed racing. And when the last lap has been run, the miners wash the dust out of their lungs with a few beers and a few songs. <laughs> it's great to be in Cooper Pedy. <laughs> Here's a song that sort of sets Boredom in the Outback, not in Cooper Pedy. It's a good sing along, so I want you to all sing along with this one, right? This song was recorded in England and would sound like this. Each day here brings something different. Hope, disappointment, and perhaps the overwhelming sight of an opal that glows like the setting sun. As another day ends and evening falls on the fields of Cooper Pedy, silence is rare. The engines here run around the clock. The machines are still working even while the miners sleep. The hunt for opals, it never stops. We always pray for that magic day, brother. Every, it could be just beyond an inch of that dirt. You know, you pick away. You make opal, then it'll come, and then it'll disappear quick as it comes and then bang, you can just add that magic stone. That, that magic stone can be that size, a million bucks. At Cooper PD, it's all just one sunrise away. That magic day, that magic opal, the fire in the stone. It is the stuff of legends.
the great Augustus Caesar, hopes to push the Roman Empire beyond the boundaries of the civilized world. His faithful commander, Publius Quintilius Varus, is inexperienced and untested in the field of conflict. Varus and his army expect little in the way of resistance. They are tragically mistaken. Armed with spears and shields, a force of German tribesmen gather to face the might of Rome. At their head, a daring young chieftain by the name of Arminius. It was one of the bloodiest battles of antiquity. When the slaughter was finished, 20,000 of Rome's finest lay dead or dying in the mud. So great was the shock that for years afterwards, Augustus is said to have beaten his head on a door shouting, Quinctilius Varus, give me back my legions. Although the massacre left an indelible mark on history, the site of the battle disappeared in the tangle of an ancient forest. Today, archaeologists are reaping an unexpected harvest in a swatch of German farmland, hundreds of Roman artifacts. Have they found the site of Rome's defeat, the source of Caesar's nightmare? On a hill overlooking the city of Detmold in western Germany, an imposing statue immortalizes the young hero who stood against Rome. While the Romans mourned their defeat, the Germans celebrated it in myth and legend. But details of the battle seem lost forever to the passage of time. In the first century AD, Germany was a trackless land of mountains and forests, inhabited by tribes of warlike barbarians. Fiercely independent, they looked on the encroaching Romans with suspicion and dread. The century before, the great Julius Caesar had doubled the size of the Roman Empire. After subduing the Mediterranean, he turned northward and conquered Gaul, establishing a stronghold on the west bank of the Rhine. To consolidate Caesar's gains, the Emperor Augustus extended the frontier to the Danube. Next, he annexed the territory between the Rhine and the Elbe. An invasion seemed only a matter of time. But the Germans were ill-prepared. They needed a leader, someone charismatic who could unite them in a common cause, someone who could rally a force strong enough to confront a highly disciplined military machine. The young Arminius, only 27 years old, had unique credentials. Although a German chieftain, he was well trained in Roman tactics. As a Roman citizen, he had served in the army and sworn allegiance to the emperor until Augustus made a fateful decision. He named Pilius Quinctilius Varus, governor of Germany. An aristocrat, Varus was also arrogant and tactless. His presence on German soil was all Arminius needed to spark a rebellion and unite the tribes. In 9 AD, Arminius seized his opportunity. He attacked Varus and his legions. After three days of fighting, the battle was over. 20,000 men, 10,000 camp followers were virtually annihilated. Unable to face the shame of such a catastrophe, Varus and his lieutenants committed suicide. Their voices silenced, Rome's most humiliating defeat in centuries faded into history. With few witnesses to recount the disaster, the whereabouts of the killing field also slipped away. For 2,000 years, no one has been certain exactly where the battle was fought. The search to find it would become one of the great detective stories of archaeology. It begins in the 16th century, when a manuscript written by the Roman historian Tacitus was discovered in a German monastery. Tacitus was the first to identify the Teutoburg forest, some 200 square miles of what is today gently rolling hills and woodlands. Over the years, Roman antiquities began to turn up in several different locations, but few associated them with the battle. Then, in 1987, 
an amateur archaeologist prospecting on a northern edge of the forest, uncovered an unusual cache of new artifacts. The discovery attracted the attention of the Museum of Cultural History in nearby Osnabrück. The excavation, located at the foot of Kalkreiser Mountain, has yielded hundreds of tiny fragments, each a clue that here something dramatic occurred. After years of painstaking analysis, Chief Archaeologist Suzanne Wilbers Rost and her team have pieced together the uniform of a Roman soldier and the weapons he carried. We found, for example, this hook to fasten the epaulets of a chain mail coat. It mentions a certain Marcus Ayas of the first cohort of Fabricius. The first cohort was the elite unit of a Roman legion. The find is hard evidence that heavily armed infantry were present in the area. This javelin clamp was used to attach the iron to the wooden shaft of a Roman javelin, a very long weapon. The base section of the javelin could be driven firmly into the ground. The sandals were very important. They were made of leather and had iron cleats in the soles. The helmet had a plume holder on which plumes could be fixed on special occasions. A Roman dinar, a silver coin. I don't know if you've already seen this. Look, there is a galley on it, a ship. Down here you can see the oars. We have several of this type. That fits into the context. But it's a rarity on this site. On this excavation, we've only found six or seven silver coins. These scattered relics of a Roman army bear mute testimony to an ancient conflict. But is it the infamous battle of 9 AD? discoveries are a collection of copper coins. Wolfgang Schlutter, director of the museum, believes that they hold the answer. We have here a such copper münze. Here we have a copper coin, of which we have found about 200 so far. These are surely only a fraction of the coins lost here. And these coins are the best way to date this event. Roman soldiers were paid in copper coins. On one side was the hallmark of the Emperor Augustus. On the other, the stamp of their commander, Quinctilius Varus. In the year 7 AD, Varus became the governor of Germania. Therefore, it was only from this date that he could put his stamp on the coin. So we can say on the one hand, we have found no coins dating after 9 AD, and because these coins were produced starting in the year 7, they could only have been lost in the year 7, 8, or 9. This would indicate that we have situated the Varus battle in 9 AD. The location of the forgotten battleground now seems certain. Archaeologists have also excavated a strange-looking mound at the base of the mountain. Their work reveals a man-made rampart some 600 feet long and 7 feet high. We suspect that the Romans came from the east. That is to say, they came from this direction and marched along this path. They were attacked from different ramparts, which in our opinion, the Germans had built for the ambush. So far, we have excavated only one of these ramparts. That rampart lies over in that direction, at the foot of the Calcresa mountain. This is the old ground level, from the time of the Romans. It clearly marks the outer edge of the rampart. The Romans came along this path, just below here. Then they were attacked from the rampart and were clearly annihilated. The construction of a rampart suggests Arminius knew which route the advancing Roman column would take. But how did he know? Wolfgang Schlutter thinks his knowledge of the terrain 
gave the Germans an edge. The Roman troops came from the east. Now, presumably, they tried to get through here, between the Kalkrisse mountain and the Wien mountain range. But they had to admit it was impossible due to the high altitudes. They retreated and went around the mountain using the shortest path possible to surmount this obstacle. The Roman troops had two possibilities. Either they could march in a long queue for 10 or 12 kilometers, in which case they were vulnerable to attack from the side. Or they could march in wide formation, but then they faced continual traffic jams at the narrow passage points. Imagine a three-lane highway narrowing to one lane. Then you get traffic jams for many kilometers. And that is exactly what happened here. Schlitter's findings confirmed Tacitus's account of the battle. Varus led his army through treacherous terrain. On one side, Tacitus records, it was flanked by marshes, bogs, and swamps. On the other, by densely wooded hills. Here, they encountered the ambush. It is deathly quiet in the Tudorberg forest. An autumn rain chills the air. The Germans, invisible behind their earthen ramparts, patiently wait. Anticipation steals their nerves. In the distance can be heard the footfalls of the approaching Romans. Then finally, out of the mist, a golden eagle appears, the battle standard of a Roman legion. Troops, pulled apart by the long march, are caught by surprise. Trapped in close quarters, their spears and swords become useless. Combat is hand to hand. Within moments, the dying begins. Archaeologist Michael Gester thinks the Battle of Teutoburg Forest was no battle at all. It was a massacre. These kleinen Truppen, römischer Soldaten, die eigentlich nur These troops of Roman soldiers were only trained to fight in open fields. They were not suited to ward off small partisan attacks. Angriffe abzuwehren und because of this they were massacred man for man. Isolated troops were able to fight their way through. Others surrendered and were butchered. And still others fought on, but were overrun by the Germans who were more familiar with the terrain. The overwhelming success of their ambush may explain why few German artifacts have been found. Mostly the fragments of a Roman army literally torn to shreds, their bodies and their weapons plundered. How could such a disaster befall an army that time after time followed Julius Caesar into battle and reigned victorious? Christopher Ruger, professor of Roman studies at the University of Bonn, thinks Quinctilius Varus was to blame. He acquired his experience in provincial administration in quite a different hotspot of Rome. Syria, that was at the time, Palestine. It was as turmoil -y, as rebellious as it is now between Israel and all the Arab states. There were factions, there were PLOs, there were Haganahs and whatnot, and Varus pretty well muddled through this sort of mess in the East. But he never had experience with a guerrilla warfare beyond north of the Alps. Arminius, on the other hand, was a young German nobleman of the Cherusca tribe who had worked for the Romans as an auxiliary troop leader and had Roman citizenship. He was highly familiar with Roman military tactics. And this explains why Arminius knew the weaknesses of Roman military tactics when marching through difficult territory. His plan of attack in the Teutoburg forest was based on this knowledge. Im Bereich des Waldes. They operated in small units and in on swampy marshy grounds 
in forests, as Tacitus uh, recalls. And of course, the Romans were afraid of the forest, whereas the Germanic warriors just loved the bushes. They just loved the bush. They were able to operate very much more efficient in country like that. It should also be said that it was raining that September and the Roman equipment became heavy since it was becoming waterlogged. The Germans, of course, had no armor, only simple wooden shields. Accordingly, their equipment did not become as heavy as that of the Roman soldiers. When the Romans were ambushed, they were heading back to their winter quarters at Haltern, a heavily fortified garrison east of the Rhine. A team of archaeologists, led by Rudolf Askamp, director of the Roman Museum in Haltern, have been excavating the site. Archaeologists now believe that the camp of Haltern was probably built around the year zero. The camp existed up to the year 9 AD, when it was destroyed in connection with the slaughter in the Teutoburg forest. We have evidence that one of the legions that went under in this massacre was the 19th Legion. It was previously stationed in Halten. We have cleared the bones of the dirt and are now reinforcing them with plaster so that we can get them to the museum intact, otherwise they would break. Over here we see the remains of the skull. We have only the outline, which we can just barely recognize. Here, I'm going around once. Next, we see where the spinal cord, that is the neck, was attached to the head. And over here is what would have been the upper body. Archaeologists now believe that Halton was destroyed by the Germans as part of a larger strategy to stop the empire's expansion and eventually weaken its grip on the Rhine. Six years after the battle, Augustus, bent on revenge, sent his son-in-law Germanicus back into the Teutoburg forest. According to Tacitus, the scene lived up to all its horrible associations. A half-ruined breastwork and shallow ditch showed where the last pathetic remnant had gathered. On the open ground were whitening bones, scattered where men had fled, heaped up where they had stood and fought back. Fragments of spears and of horses' limbs lay there, also human heads fastened to tree trunks. In groves nearby were the outlandish altars at which the Germans had massacred the Roman colonels and senior commanders. Germanicus conducted several retaliatory raids against the Germans. Among his duties was an order to retrieve the golden eagles of the three lost legions captured by Arminius during the battle. And at stake was the pride of the Roman army. The three legions that were destroyed, the 17th, 18th, and 19th, never existed again. It was typical of the Romans not to reinstate a destroyed legion. It was an unheard loss. Ever since Carthage and Hannibal's battles, it was the biggest blow to the Roman army. So many losses, 30,000 people lost. Uh, they could have recruited them back in a whiff, in a year's time, but it affected Roman pride. It afflict, affected the Gloria Romanorum. The big issue of Rome was the pride of its army, and that was affected. So it was much more a political blow than a military one. The eagles were brought back to Rome, and then we don't know. Either they were destroyed or melted down in the course of the centuries. The Battle of Teutoburg Forest once and for all put an end to the dream of expansion. Today, the monument in Detmold commemorates a fleeting moment of glory, but it also serves as a reminder. Without Arminius, 
the hero of Teutoburg Forest. One can only wonder how history might have been different. Blooded by the loss of his crack legions, Augustus never again dared turn a coveting eye on the lands beyond the Rhine and Danube. For him and his successors, the lost marked a first crack in the imperial shield. For the Germanic peoples, it planted the seeds of a national consciousness that would transform the ancient world. Another ancient world tomorrow. Join the search.